Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I know I'm a little bit late in this lecture, but I hope the wait would be worth it. So previously we have been talking about the two-dimensional unsteady diffusion equation and we saw how we can incorporate the unsteady time derivative term. So today in the first part of this lecture, we are going to build up on that. We are going to take the MATLAB code and we are going to see how we can see the solution that is evolving with time. We know that it's a transient phenomena, so it means that the flow field or in this case the temperature field would be evolving with time. So we want to see how this uh, temperature field is evolving and secondly if we want to evaluate the temperature at any particular time or time step how we can do that. So those are the two things that would be done in the first part and in the second part of this lecture we would be diving a little bit deeper into this uh, equation uh, all together. So we would be talking about what is called as the convection diffusion equation. So, so far we have been talking only about the diffusion equation, then we introduce this unsteady diffusion and now we are coming to the core of the subject which is only possible if we involve that convection term. So let's first look at the first part where we would start with the unsteady diffusion equation and uh, I'll give you a quick recap of what we have been doing so far and then we'll see how we can uh, see the time evolution of this particular solution using MATLAB. So let's jump right in. So on the screen we have the unsteady diffusion equation here in the box and we saw that if we use a forward differencing in time and a central differencing in space we can arrive at this particular discretized version where it says that that the new value of t at any i comma j it's equal to t i j at old which is n and the time step plus delta t over h square where h is the grid spacing times a where a is nothing but this particular value that is the sum of the neighbors minus four times the value at i comma j so for this we had already written a code so this is my matlab uh, command window which is clean my workspace again clean so it just means that i'm starting from a zero solution here so on the left here what you see is the code that we wrote last time so this is exactly the same code and on the right is just just a code with some minor modifications that I would be walking you through. So one, one thing that at this point you might ask is how I can get uh, an environment like this where you want to compare two different codes or you want to see what are the differences in two set of codes. So you can go here in view and rather than single, so if I have single, I have all the codes lined up here or all the open scripts lined up here. And if I change it to left and right, I can get something like this that would allow me to compare these two codes one on one. So the first thing is we clear all the variable, we close all the figures and we clean the command window. That is exactly the same. The way in which we have defined the mesh is also the same, except that for if you remember, we started with uh, a 51 by 51 grid and then we moved on to a 101 by 101. So that is why this difference in the number here, but that is not uh, something that would influence the code as such. If I go further down, so this is where I initialize the problem in these two parts. So you can see that I have added one line of code here, which says that y transient is equal to zero. So let me explain how we can uh, store the information that is being uh, collected at multiple time steps. So, so far what we had been doing was we get the new value and we replace the old value with the new value. We used to say that y equals to y new. So every time the information was being overwritten by the new value. And now if you want to see the time evolution, we want to have all that information at every time step. So what we are doing for that is we are creating a new array that contains the information of y 
at every time step. So previously, Y, let us say we are using a grid size of 51 by 51. So every time the Y or the Y knew it was 51 by 51. Now, if we want to incorporate this time series into that, we need an array or in this case, a 3D matrix. The, the first component of that 3D matrix would be to handle this time index and the second or the third and the second and the third would be the same as the y or y new. So you can think of this as a space time kind of uh, matrix where I am using one of these index to store the time information while the second and the third would in, in store the that two dimensional information. I'll walk you through the code and then it would be more clear as to what I'm trying to say. So after I define that the y transient is zero, it's just a way of initializing a particular variable. So that's the only difference in these two code. Then I go to the calculation part. In the calculation part, you will see that this until this particular line where we obtain the new value, we are having exactly the same thing. But after I calculate this y new, what I'm saying is that y transient iterations plus one. So this iterations plus one is to store the time step into that. So if you remember, we start with iterations being zero and because MATLAB doesn't like the zero index, it starts with the first index. So that is why iterations plus one, because I want to store the first iteration into the first time step. So the first index of uh, this 3D matrix goes as Y transient being iterations plus one. And then the second and the third index, which is from one to end point. So this says from one to 51 or 101. And again, the same from one to end points. And it says that, assign that to be Y new. So now you can see that iterations plus one is used to handle the time indexing while one to endpoints and one to endpoints. This give you a 51 by 51 uh, indexing, which is exactly used to store this Y new. So the first index is constant. Remember the first index at this point is one. The second index is from one to 51. The third index is 1 to 51. So these are uh, varying. So you can store multiple information into that. And because this Y or Y new, it's a 51 by 51 matrix. So we use this third, second and the third index to store that information. So in this way, for every time step, we store the information the second and the third index would remain exactly the same because they are 51 by 51. But the first index that corresponds to time, it would change with every iteration. So let's say after the first iteration, the variable iterations would become one. And when the code would come to this Y transient, it would say that iterations plus one would become two. And this says that two, 51, one to 51 and one to 51. So again, the, the second time step solution, the second Y new, it would be stored in the second time index of Y transient. So this way you can, so what I'll do is, because this takes a lot of time, so I'll run this particular code with, let us say, a slightly smaller grid. So I'll go back, I'll see that the things have been initialized here. And you can see that the Y transient is absolutely zero while the Y and Y new are 31 by 31. And when I initialize or when I run this calculation loop, so I'll, I want to show you what happens or how the Y transient actually looks like. So everything else here, after this particular line of code, after this Y transient line, everything else is exactly the same as the previous code the error magnitude and everything is exactly the same. The slight modification I did was I changed this uh, remainder line because I wanted to see the solution after every hundred time steps. 
because it usually takes a long time because now we are saving the values of every time step into a variable so the memory buffer that you would need for these calculations would be much larger that is why I am reducing that uh, printing command so that I can see the evolution and I can judge how faster it, the computations are going so if I come here there are there were two plots that we did last time we did the contour plot and we saw how we can plot the error with time and I also show you how to do the subplots so these are exactly the same here these two parts and first thing that I want to talk about today is how can you plot a particular time step so now because of y transient we have the information of this variable y or the temperature field at any particular time step so we can select any time step and then we can see how the uh, temperature contour or the temperature profiles are looking like at that particular time so I would go back to this single uh, view so that you can see it clearly as to what exactly is happening so let me go back here so the solutions are now converged and one thing to note here is that y and y new they are both 31 by 31 I had changed the grid size to 31 and we saw that the solution is converged in about 6374 iterations and that gives me a 3D matrix y transient which is 600374 as the first index while the second and the third index is 31 by 31 so for every index or for every first index in y transient we have this 2D matrix you can think of it as a 3D cuboid where the cross section area of that represents the y or the temperature field at any particular time step and along the length or along the length of this q cuboid sorry you have the time index so i hope it would be clear as to what we are actually trying to do so to plot any particular time step let us say i select a time step of 100 and these two lines the x domain and y domain are used to generate a grid so i'll first run these four line of code and then what i'm doing is i'm extracting that particular information from y transient because i only want the information at time step 100 so i'm saying that y at that particular time step is to be fetched from y transient and we only need the first index here because as soon as we get the first index we locate that time location we want the entire 2d data out of it so we write the first index which is time step selected and these columns indicate that i want the entire information so as soon as i hit this particular line one thing one very important thing to note here is that that the y time step is actually again a 3d matrix because that first information is stored as one variable so you can think of it as a, a 2d matrix with one 3d element so we still are not getting a 31 by 31 rather we have one by 31 by 31 and if you try to use the contour f command on it you will be failed because the contour it only works on the 2d uh, 2d data sets so the urgency that we do is we need to convert or we need to reshape this 3d matrix which is not really a 3d matrix 2d to a 2d matrix so the command for that is using reshape so what reshape does is it create or it reshapes the variable into of another variable of different size the only requirement is that the number of elements should remain the same so let us say if you have a 3 by 2 matrix and if you want to convert it into a 2 by 3 matrix that is possible but you can't convert it to let's let us say 4 by 1 because the number of variables would be different so what we do is we use the command reshape we say that we want to reshape the y time step and this particular line of code it says that i want to reshape it into a 51 or 31 in this case into a n points by n points so one advice here is never 
try to hard code anything in this code. For instance, if I had hard coded 31 or 51 here, and if I say change the grid size at other, let us say when I'm running the code later on, this code might fail because, because of that hard coded 31 or 51. So always try to make the code more general. So this is where we are using endpoints rather than hard coding any particular number. So we are saying that reshape the Y time step, which is initially one by 31 by 31 to 31 by 31. And as soon as I do that, so I'm here, I'm overriding this Y time step. So when I evaluate this, you can see that the Y time step is now 31 by 31. So we have removed that one from here. So we have converted this from a 3D system to a 2D system, which is now suitable for plotting. So once we do that, we can use the contour F command and then the color bar. And I'm also using this title command here, which I'll show you what it would be doing. So as soon as I give this command, I'll wait. I'll put the plot on the other window so I can explain a little better. So what the contour F did was to plot the contour at that particular time instant. The color bar gave you the color bar corresponding to these colors. And this title command, it put the uh, title of this time at the top. So the way I have written this is, I say that the time equals to, and because corresponding to the time step selected, this might change. So I say that this command is called as number to string because in the title, you can only have the strings. So again, remember previously we were talking about how the labels were assigned to be string. You can't use anything else for the labeling. And similarly for the title, you only need the strings. So if you have some variable, let in this case, we had these numbers, one second, two second, we had to convert this into string. So the command is called as num to str, which converts a number to the string. So we say that convert that number to string and the number is time step selected multiply by dt. Don't forget this dt because if you don't use it, you'll simply get 100 here, which is not true because we are having these as time steps, but not as physical time. So this is how you can plot a particular time instant. Now, I'll give you an overview how you can see the time evolution with time. So the idea is very simple. So in this case, we had picked up one particular time. So for the time evolution, what we would do is we would define an array of this time. So our time step selected would vary from, let us say, 1, then 100, 200, 300. And for every of those time step, we would plot the contour. But rather than plotting very quickly, we would wait for a hiccup and that would allow us to see that transient growth. Again, this is not a very official way, but this is good enough to show, for instance, in a presentation. I'll later show you how you can save this as, for instance, a movie or something. But for now, if you just want to quickly live demonstrate to someone as to how the time evolution of this problem was, you can use this particular command. So the way in which we do is, we say that, uh, let us say we want to animate it after every 100 time steps. Again, see that I'm not generalized, I'm not hard coding anything here. I say that I can change this value of n. So I say that uh, if I want to animate it after every 100 time, I can create this time step array, which starts from one. And I know that, the maximum value of iterations is about 6000. So 100 is a reasonable value there. So this time step array, so if I run these two lines of code, so this time step array is nothing but 1, then 101, 201. So what I want to see is I want to see the solution being evolved at all of these time. So then I open a new figure. So what I'll do here is I'll put the figure in this side and now to plot this evolution, I want to put together these figures on top of each other. So what I'm doing is I'm using a for loop for plotting. So what I need is I have this time indexing 
I have this uh, array of uh, time step that I want to plot the solution on. So I use this uh, every element using a for loop and I plot these solutions on top of each other one at a time. So I start with the time step one, plot it, look at it for a little bit and then plot 101 on top of, top of it. And that keeps on going until the very end of this array, this time step array. So I say that for i being 1 to the length of this time step array. So length of the time step array was 64 if you remember. So the length of the time, time step array was 64. And we say that the selected time step is the time step array, the, the index of that time step array. So you remember that this i would vary from 1 to 64 but the corresponding time step selected. So let us say i equals to, I'll say i equals to 64. That should correspond to this particular value, right? So time step selected would correspondingly be 6301. And then I'm using these again, the same line of code here that the y time step is fetched from the y transient. And then we reshape it and again, we plot the contour, we plot the color bar, we put a title so that we can see what time instance it is. And finally, I gave it a pause of 0.25 seconds. So I gave this pause so that we can see the time evolution. You can give a larger pause if you want to explore more features or you can just put it there until you say press any command or any button so that the figure would continue plotting. So once I do that, if I perform this particular action. So you can see here on the right that uh, all of these figures are being plotted on top of each other with a weight of uh, a quarter second, which is not very easily detectable from a naked eye. But you can see that this is good enough for you to demonstrate how the temperature field is changing with time. Finally, let us say you don't want a 2D contour, you just want to plot a temperature at, let us say, the center line, which is one of the very good ways to validate your results. So remember, you have this, uh, let us say you only want the final temperature profile at the center line. So to do that, we have this 31 by 31. So you remember, these are the rows and these are the columns. So, and if you want to, let us say, get the middle column, or somebody had asked you to get the temperature as a function of y along the center line. So what you need to do there is you need to pick the correct column and have the value for all the rows. I'll quickly demonstrate you what I'm trying to say here. So we have this uh, small y, which is 31 by 31. And let us say that we want the temperature value at the center line across this y direction. So we want, we know that if we want to get along the y, we need to include all the rows, but only a fixed column. To do that, we say that y center equals to y. Then I put a column to include that I want to incorporate all the rows and the center index here would be 16. So you can always generalize it. I'm hard coding it here because I'm in the command window. But if I were in the editor, I would use 31, which is n points, plus 1 divided by 2. So if I go here, I get the y center as a 31 by 1 vector. And then you can plot, I'll use a new figure, otherwise my figure would be overridden. So once I do that, you can plot any of these profiles, any of these 1D profiles, all you have to do, you have to extract that information. Just like we were extracting these 2D matrix, matrix from these 3D Y transient matrix, in a similar way, you can extract a 1D vector or a 1D profile from these 3D matrices. Now, having done this, now we'll move to the second part of this lecture. So, so far we have been looking at uh, how to discretize your equation using finite differencing. So, I hope that this would be clear now. So, we had gone through diffusion, 
Then we jumped on to unsteady diffusion. We have been looking at both the 1D and 2D phenomena using finite differencing. And now we'll introduce the convection part into our equations. So in this part, I'll, I'll not walk you through the MATLAB part. So first we'll look at the theoretical aspects. And then once we are perfectly aligned with the theoretical part, then we'll move on to MATLAB. But another thing that I want to mention here is, now we want to introduce the concept of finite volume method. These are again a subset of uh, computational methods that can be used to calculate your solutions on these kind of grid system. So once we start that, then you will be more comfortable with what I'm trying to say. So I'll go back to the notebook here. So we have been looking at the ones one or 2D unsteady diffusion. So now we want to introduce what is called as the convection diffusion equation. So we need to understand what these terms really mean. So diffusion implies that if you remember very basic science is that diffusion happens because of the difference in concentration for instance. So if you have a very high temperature here in a material and if you have a low temperature here and you have something that connects the two, let us say you have the steel rod or whatever, then because of uh, the material properties, in this case we used to have diffusion coefficient, the temperature would diffuse from a higher value to a lower value. So this doesn't really involve any kind of flow happening there. So to incorporate that flow, we have this convection term, which takes into account a flow that might be happening at the same time. So you can think of uh, convection for here, because the convection could be due to both due to, let us say, that when we say natural convection, then we are not uh, taking into account any kind of flow, but when it happens with the uh, flow, then we call it as a free convection and or, or a force convection. So in that case, we consider that flow. So in this case, we are going to look at uh, those kind of problems where we have a convective part that happens due to flow, and we also consider the diffusive part that happens because of these gradients. So I'll first start with writing a general value or a general uh, idea of what a convection diffusion equation looks like and then I'll explain uh, all these parts. So in the general form, a convection diffusion equation has an unsteady term which is represented as del over del t rho phi. So in here, I'm using these partial derivatives because I have x, y, and z also playing their variations. The rho is the density, while phi is any general variable. It could be temperature, it could be your velocity field. The convection term is written as del x rho u phi. And the diffusion term can be written as, so I'm writing it as a general way, plus S. So let me explain the convection term and then the diffusion and the source term S. So the convection term, it contains a spatial derivative, which is, it could be delta X or delta Y, but then the corresponding velocity. So U here is the X velocity. So we have X, y and z and correspondingly we have u, v and w. So we have this as a space variable and we have this as a, I'm sorry, so this is the velocity. Because velocity is a 3D field, so we have u, v and w as the three components. Rho is again the density and phi here could be another variable as the same as the unsteady part. So if the phi is equal to u, then this term would become rho u squared. If the phi is equal to temperature, then it would become rho u t. As I was saying that uh, the diffusion part 
is happening because of the temperature or the gradients in the flow that is why you have this d phi dx term and this tau is called as the diffusion coefficient and this s is called as the source term so let us say if you have a heater placed inside a domain then that heater would act like as a source term it could also be a sink which means that if something is coming out of it then we have to take care regarding that so this is a general form of convection diffusion equation so this could be a 3d version but we would for now we would only be looking at a very special case which is steady and one dimensional so when i say steady it means that there are no time derivatives and when i say one dimensional it means that it only varies in one dimension and that implies if there are no time derivatives then we can change the partial derivative to total derivative so if i write the special case of a steady 1d and not write the entire thing so i'll say it as the convection diffusion equation this could be written as d over dx so this particular unsteady term would vanish so i have d over dx rho u phi equals to d over dx tau not t tau d phi over dx let us say this is the equation we want so coming to the finite volume method so in finite element method what we did uh, sorry in finite differencing what we did was we had a domain and we divided that domain into multiple segments using what is called as the grid so the idea here remains exactly the same we have an over underlying grid and a grid grid points but rather than using the taylor series to get those derivatives what we do is we consider a control volume or a finite volume around any particular grid point and then we exploit the basic fundamentals of that control volume to discretize this equation so let me explain you through a picture here so let us say we have a 1d system we have this uh, i minus 1 we have this i and we have this i plus 1 so you, this must be familiar to you right so let us call this i as the point as p which is the focus of our attention and then i plus 1 because it's lying in the eastern side to i we call this as e and similarly i minus 1 because it lies in the western side it would become w so in finite volume method we consider a finite volume around this point p so one way to consider this particular finite volume is to take half of this line segment and create this finite volume here so i'll just share it for your convenience so now we have this uh, finite volume that's sitting around p but not going all the way towards the capital e and capital w and i'll call these edges here or the points here as small e and small w so the way in which we move towards the discretized version of this equation is we take the governing equation and we integrate it over the control volume so previously we were using taylor series expansion to substitute for these derivatives but in finite volume methods we take the governing equation as it is with no approximation so this is important so with taylor series we were truncating our series but in finite volume we take the entire equation as it is and integrate it over the control volume so if i do this for now so we have d over dx rho u phi equals to d over dx tau d phi over dx so if i want to integrate it over the entire control volume it means that i am integrating it from the point small w to point small e and similarly in the other direction and we can write a dx here because it's been integrated in x 
So because there is a spatial derivative here sitting already, which means I can simply integrate uh, the rho u phi as it is. And when I take the limits, it means that it becomes rho u phi at E minus rho u phi at W. And that would simply be equal to, similarly we can, for this part, we can cancel out the time der uh, spatial derivative with the integrand here. And what we have is tau d phi over dx at point E minus tau d phi over dx at point small w. Now the fun part happens as to how we can evaluate these small e and small w properties. So that is where we can use different kind of schemes. So one of the very simpler scheme is to assume that the function phi it varies linearly between all these points. So what I mean to say is we are saying that the value of phi from let us say this is phi w, this is phi p and let us say this is phi e. So let us say if the value is uh, or if the function phi is varying linearly between these points or we are trying to say that the function phi is piecewise linear, we can very simply write what we can write because the phi w it's lying in the exact center. So we have defined these control volumes or the finite volumes such that phi w or the small w it's exactly at the center. So we can write that phi small w is half of phi capital P plus phi capital W. And similarly phi x small e is equals to phi 1 by 2 phi capital P plus phi capital E, right? So these things can be substituted here. And the way in which we do is, we keep the rho and u as it is. So once we do that, we get 1 by 2 rho u e. And then for phi small e, we get phi p plus phi e, capital E. And similarly, we get here 1 by 2 rho u w, small w, phi p plus phi capital W. And now, since we assume that uh, the function phi, it was varying linearly between, let us say this is point P and this is point E, capital E, then the derivative of this function at small e, it would simply be phi E minus phi P divided by delta X. Because for a line, we know that uh, the slope of this line is y2 minus y1 divided by the delta x. So we can write, so I'll write it over here. So we can write the d phi over dx at capital small e. So it means that the derivative on this particular point, it would simply be phi capital E minus phi capital P divided by delta x. And I'm writing delta x e in case we are considering a non-uniform mesh. But the idea here is the same that we have this intersection points exactly halfway there. So that is why we can write 1 by 2. So if we do that, we get this tau e, then this can be substituted here, which becomes phi e minus phi p divided by delta x e minus tau w phi for the w here, so we are looking at this particular point here. So it would become phi capital P minus phi capital W divided by delta x w. So I'm not trying to scare you, but we are going to simplify this equation by assuming something. So we're just trying to simplify how it's looking, but not really simplifying it numerically as such. We have already considered that the phi is varying piecewise linearly. So because this particular term is appearing both ways here, so we call this as, let us say we represent this as f and we say that f is equals to rho times u. So f is called as the convection strength. And similarly, this particular term, 
the tau over delta x we call it as a d so we say that d is tau over delta x and we say that this is the diffusion part so we if we say that f is equal to rho u while d is equal to tau divided by rho uh, delta x we can simplify this equation as so it would become f e by 2 phi capital p plus phi capital e minus f w by 2 phi capital p plus phi capital w equals to d e these are all small these e and w they are all small because they corresponding to the control volume faces phi e minus phi p minus d w small w phi capital p minus phi capital w so now we have converted the entire system of equations from this small variable we still have the f and d being as a small but our phi it only have the capital terms so what we do is we segregate it such that we have the point p the phi p is on one side and phi everything else on the other side so this equation has a general solution which says that a p phi p is equals to a e phi capital e plus a w phi w so in this case the a e simply becomes so the a e is the coefficient of phi e so the coefficient of phi e here is f small e divided by 2 and here it is d e and because this is on the other side of equality here it's positive so here it would become negative similarly the a w is d w plus f w divided by 2 and a p would become f e divided by 2 minus f w divided by 2 plus d e plus t w i know this might look a little bit scary and uh, very different from what we had been doing earlier but spend a little bit time on this derivation see how we designed the control volume how we assumed linearity and we defined the small phi e phi small w and how we integrate that particular equation once you give it a little bit practice this method is very efficient and uh, we would proceed from here in the next lecture. There are many kind of schemes that we can use for evaluating these coefficients. So we have this uh, convection strength F and the diffusion strength as D. So we would see how different kind of schemes can be used to evaluate these terms and because convection is such a tricky part to deal with because it has this non-linear term. So because we have the rho u and another variable phi it, it has these non-linear properties that can really cause troubles in the computation that is why i'm trying to be very cautious in introducing the convection term so in the next lecture we would go through some numerical techniques uh, to handle uh, the solution of the convection diffusion equation and then subsequently we would start coding for that in matlab so the next one or two lecture it might be devoted towards understanding the discretization of the convection diffusion equation and then we'll take up from there if you have any questions please feel free to write in the comments i'll try my best to answer every one of them or incorporate some of them in the next lecture if that deserves any particular time and uh, hopefully uh, you are enjoying and learning with the process and uh, i'll see you in the next one